And continuing in our reading of Paul's words to the church on the gifts of the Spirit from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we now begin at verse 14. Hear now God's word. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot were to say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear were to say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members that, of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body given the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. This is the word of the Lord. In her biography of Abraham Lincoln, Doris Kearns Goodwin presents an intriguing perspective on the life and the light of this political genius. Her book is not only the story of Lincoln's rise to the presidency and the way he carried out his duties during the perhaps the most difficult and darkest days of our nation, but his insight into how he used his skill to bring together diverse people to use their abilities for the greater good. Lincoln chose for his cabinet officers three men who had all had presidential ambitions and who had been his arrivals for the 1860 Republican presidential nomination. Edward Bates, Salmon Chase, William Seward. These were men of great ambition, large egos, and tremendous talent. They were men who initially saw Lincoln as a backwoods, unsophisticated, inexperienced leader. How could he have won the nomination? Yet Lincoln became, over the years, a master at handling their abilities, managing their egos, and engaging their talents in the service of the common good. You know, I think at times a church can be something like Lincoln's cabinet. Wonderfully talented people living together in challenging times, running off in a hundred different directions, holding tenaciously to all sorts of ideas about the way things ought to be, and insisting that every other member think and act the way they do. Lincoln's cabinet. Well, it was a little like that for Paul as well. Paul had established the Corinthian church. He'd given his life blood to the church. And now he was having to help the church sort out differences at a distance. Here he was, heart and soul, in this mission and ministry, and yet he is at a distance and has to write the church letters trying to encourage them to think about themselves in the way that God thinks of them, to use their gifts in the way God wants them to use it. Paul's Corinthian church was a little like Lincoln's cabinet. Some people thought they were more important than others, 
Some people thought that their gifts and their work should be recognized and honored above others. And frankly, some people believed that everybody else ought to think and act as they do. So Paul gets down to basics. He's quick to remind the church in Corinth how the church is one body composed of many members. The Spirit gives gifts for ministry to each one of the members of the body, just as the Holy Spirit gave birth on the day of Pentecost to the whole church and showered upon those, those unschooled and timid disciples gifts they didn't know they had and couldn't in their wildest imagination dream of ever having. And these Ordinary disciples, then in the power of the Spirit, went out into the world to live for Jesus and to proclaim the gospel in the Roman Empire. The Spirit showered upon them gifts of healing and teaching and administration and love and compassion and wisdom and preaching and discernment, everything they needed to fulfill God's calling upon their lives. You know, the word here in the 12th chapter of Corinthians for this word gifts is charismata. We're used to thinking of charismatic Christians as those who have a particular gift such as speaking and interpreting tongues. And so we think of that as a, a narrow portion, a small part of the larger church of Christ. However, we are all charismatic Christians. We are all filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We're all those upon whom God has showered wonderful gifts of grace. For the very root of the word charismata is charis, grace. We are grace-filled, spirit-filled, talented Christians. And these gifts are not our own. They are not our achievement. To discover our spiritual gifts awakens us not to arrogance and selfishness and pride and boastfulness, but to humility and gratitude and joy. Not only are we all given gifts, but we are not all given the same gifts, Paul is quick to add. Paul says that there are many different kinds of gifts working in the church, but the same Spirit gives them all. The same Spirit motivates and engages them all. The one Spirit calls us to live, to work, and to serve together. It's our prideful nature it's our limited human perspective that leads us to consider some gifts, particularly our own, as more important than other people's gifts. But Paul reminds us just how essential, how important each gift is for the well-functioning, the well-being of the whole. Indeed, he goes on to say that we're to give special honor to those gifts that the world may consider to be less important, less significant than others. In the first congregation I served, there was a deacon who worked for the county. He mowed the grass and the weeds along the county roads and the highways. It was hot, dangerous, and thankless work. He had a scar to show his efforts. It ran from his ear all the way down to his chin where baling wire that had gotten caught up in his mowing machine had, had cut across his face. He was a rather quiet man who felt that what he did was not all that important. And so one day we were at church talking about how the Holy Spirit gives gifts to the church that everyone has gifts we are graced by God. We are grace-filled people. And he said, I don't think I have any particular gifts and what I do is not very important. Another woman in the church looked him in the eyes and said, now wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want you to know that when I drive my car on these roads and when the corn is high, I cannot see what cars are passing at every intersection. And if it weren't for someone like you who's out there in the hot sun mowing down those weeds and that tall grass, I might not even be alive today. What you do brings life to us all. Each one of us can think of someone whose gifts, whose talents, whose ordinary labors makes life better for others because of quite quiet, faithful service without seeking honor or recognition of any kind. 
I remember a retired businesswoman who joined a former congregation rather late in life, and she was a very talented businesswoman. But you know what? She didn't want to plan the budget. She didn't want to serve on a committee. She didn't want to teach in Sunday school. Instead, she would come on Wednesday evenings, just a little bit before the fellowship dinner and program, to arrange all the name tags of the congregation, those who'd made reservations, and put them in alphabetical order so that when people came, they could very easily find their names. And when they sat down to dinner, people had the capacity to get to know one another over a meal. I think of the sorters in our church who come quietly on Monday mornings over in the unfinished room in a crowded space and they sort clothes week after week after week. They sort that mountain of stuff that you bring to the church of clothes and household items. I think it's the biggest recycling project in the north side. And to think what they do working down there without complaint in a small space enabling us to carry out so many missions in Christ's name, never asking for a thank you. I said at the earlier service, I probably shouldn't say it again, but I'm going to. I think of them as the Oompa Loompas of the church. You know, you have to watch Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. They're the ones down there making the chocolate very quietly, singing their happy songs. Oh, I think about other people as well. I think about a man who leaves work early on Tuesdays to tutor a young boy so that boy will stay up with math and reading. I think about a man who has taught four-year-olds in Sunday school in another church year after year after year after year, taught Sunday school to four-year-olds and even after years of doing that says with great joy, God never made anything more wonderful than a four-year-old. I think of the youth and adults today who are going to be using their feet to walk in the crop walk, to raise money for hungry people they do not even know. I think of people using their hands to write letters today to the congressman so that we can provide food for a hungry world. It is easy to undervalue these gifts. It's easy to forget how God inhabits the ordinary moments and experiences of life when we use them to serve God, to glorify Christ, and to care for our neighbors. Simple gifts like visiting a shut-in or knitting a, a baby cap for a Riley Hospital or planting a tree or, or drawing a ventilation system for the church or trying to figure out why this room is hotter than that room and why the sanctuary is always so cold. These are always ordinary gifts, but the extraordinary means through which we experience the holy presence of the living God. Not only does God give us spiritual gifts and God gives us different kinds of gifts and not only do we lift up and honor those less important gifts in the eyes of the world, Paul also knows that we have a tendency to use God's gifts as if our gifts were the only one that matter. Yes, we're like members of Lincoln's cabinet. And it's all too easy to let ego and personal issues and poorly thought out ideas without thinking about the needs of others overwhelm service and compassion and kindness and generosity. We can become so focused on being right and my wife has been trying to teach me all these years how wrong that is. We can be so focused on being right that we forget that some things are more important, like love and meeting other people's needs. Using Paul's image of the language of the body, we may think that we are the eye and we have the vision and we don't need anybody else's insight. We may think that we're the ear and we've heard everything there is to say on that matter and we don't need to hear your words. We may think that we're the hands that do all the work, the heavy lifting, and we don't need to, somebody else to plan and to tell us what our hands ought to be doing. Sometimes we use our gifts in the wrong way. 
Wendell Berry's poetic novel, Jaber Crow, tells the story of a town barber who spent his life not only cutting hair, but his real gift was, was being the keen observer of human life in that community called Port William. Jaber Crow sees the distinct ways in which two farmers, Athy Keith and his son-in-law, Troy Chatham, live and farm. Jaber Crow observes that old Athy was not exactly what you would call a landowner. He was the farm's farmer. He was its creature and its belonging. He lived the farm's life and the farm lived his life. And he knew that of the two lives, his and the farm's, his was the smaller, his was the shorter. On the other hand, his son-in-law, Troy, thought the farm existed to, to serve and to enlarge him. Both men had, had gifts for farming. Only Athy lived in harmony with the land and rotated his crops. Athy understood that his farm was to contribute not only to the modest needs of his family, but he was to contribute to the good of the land, the earth he loved. Troy used his gifts to modernize the farm good, Buy a tractor, good. Rent more land, good. Work harder, good. Wear out the land. Get into debt. Eventually neglect his family. Not so good. One remembered the good beyond his own needs and the other thought only of using everything and everyone to satisfy his insatiable hunger and his boundless desire. One used God's holy gift in harmony with the earth. And the other squandered these precious gifts to serve himself alone. Yes, we misuse the gifts of God. And that is why Paul reminds us in these beautiful words to the Corinthians that the gifts of God are given to us to be used for the common good. These astonishing gifts, you heard the children name them. These astonishing gifts of God are ours to use to build up the body of Christ. For we are one body with many members. And the one body is never more compelling, never more beautiful, never more filled with the Spirit of God than when the many members live and serve and love in harmony together. John Buchanan has written, There is work to be done by Christian people who love the church because the church is God's precious creation. Work to be done by Christian people who not only want the church merely to survive but want the church to actually be the body of Christ in the world. Actually to convey to the world the transcendence and mystery of God. Actually to demonstrate to the world what true community in Christ is like. This church, this congregation, this body of Christ gathered here is a busy place. And if all that we do is nothing more than religious busyness, then what we do is nothing. If all that we do with the gifts of God is nothing more than serve ourselves, then it is nothing. I was here at the church yesterday, had a meeting, and after the meeting I wandered through the building. The, the handbell choir was preparing for worship this morning. The Church Library Association was having a, a workshop for area churches. Great Banquet was holding reunion groups. The food pantry was open to our community, and there were a host of other things going on in the church. And as I walked around the building, I thought about how each person I met is a part of the whole, each person a member of the body, each person using the gifts of God to upbuild Christ's body. As Paul wrote, if we were a single member, where would the body be? But we are not a single member. We are the body of Christ together. I ran into one of our members in the atrium. She was there using her spiritual gifts to, to help a family sign up for Christmas benevolence. They had apparently just finished meeting. It was a family that had come to our, our pantry, a neighbor, a guest, 
And they'd come and we want to build a relationship with them and establish more connections. And so she had been working with them so that they could participate in Christmas benevolence. But as we talked, we also talked about the prayer cards that, that our guests who come here for food, they have an opportunity to go into a prayer room and they fill out prayer requests. And these prayer requests are taken up by our Monday morning prayer group and by our staff on Tuesday in their prayers. And if you were to read these prayer requests, they would break your heart and fill your soul. But it's all a part of being the body of Christ together, realizing it's not just about feeding people food, but feeding people spiritual food. And building relationships together in the name of Jesus Christ. So that all these people, all these abundant gifts are making visible the transcendence and the mystery of God. Look at the people around you. These are God's charismatic people. They are filled with the gifts of the Spirit. Look deeply into your own soul and see the gifts of the Spirit that God has given you. Many and varied are the gifts of God. And all these gifts and all these activities are motivated and activated by the one Spirit of God. Many members together building up the one body of Christ. Amen.